So hi everyone and welcome to part 11 of my organ technology series. In this series we look at different ways that electronic organs have been built, primarily analog technology organs, but we sometimes take a look at pipe organ stuff and digital organ stuff and mostly we just try to get a little glimpse into that world and see how different things were done over the uh, century now that electronic organs have been built. So last week we took a preliminary look at my Rogers 33E built in 1971. We discovered that there was this incredible hum problem in the audio system and I explained how you know normally you kind of start at the speakers and amplifiers and you kind of work your way back through the audio chain to find out where the hum is. And we also took a brief look inside at the electronics, in particular, the 50-year-old main power supply, which is very suspect. And uh, some of the viewers of that video wrote in and said, dude, just start with that power supply. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized they're absolutely right, because the thing is, we know for sure that a 50-year-old power supply is potentially going to be a problem, and we know we're probably going to have to rebuild that power supply, so we might as well just start there, and then we'll work our way out uh, through the audio chain uh, instead of in from the outside. And, uh, you know, either way, we're going to solve the problems and figure out what in the world's going on here. So I have on the desk here... Uh, the main power supply and let's take a look okay so we're looking straight down at this uh, power supply and what is primarily suspect on this device are these capacitors right here these are 1000 microfarad uh, capacitors and what makes them suspect is they're built in these cardboard tubes and while this was very common back in the day, uh, these types of capacitors are just pretty much automatically suspect for having leaked in their uh, electrolyte material, having possibly even evaporated through the, the, the um, tube. And there's other ways that capacitors break down over time, and this type of capacitor is really kind of suspect. These two big capacitors here, these are, I believe, a 30,000 microfarad and a 40,000 microfarad. They're these big heavy-duty capacitors. They're in these metal canisters. Um, these are probably okay, and I hope they are because these can be potentially... Uh, expensive to replace whereas these are, are fairly inexpensive to deal with now of course what's going on here why why is this so terribly important well when we're dealing with electricity the line power the power that we get in off the wall when we plug something into a receptacle is alternating current but our tone generator and amplifier circuits all need direct current. And that's a fairly complex process. First, we have to use a transformer to knock that voltage down to the various voltages we need. In this case, we've got plus and minus 12 volts. We've got plus and minus 25 volts. We've got minus 15 volts. And all of that has to be worked out through all of this circuitry. Now transformers on a power supply can be uh, suspect as well if they're not top quality. This is obviously a very top quality transformer. It has lots of laminations on it, so it's probably just fine. Uh, so our main bone of contention is gonna be these capacitors. And what would that do? Well, when we rectify the power we uh, need capacitors to smooth it out so we actually get smooth DC instead of rippled DC. When the capacitors break down, then we get rippled DC, and that can be a source of hum throughout the entire audio chain. So why don't I make a little drawing here and we'll show you how that works. Okay, so we have our transformer 
and it knocks our voltage down but all it does is change the voltage it doesn't change the way the voltage works and so we go from having 110 volts AC down to say 12 volts AC but we still have this sine wave now if we use uh, a simple rectifier that sine wave gets converted into this and we can put in capacitors to smooth out these ripples but because the ripples are spaced out it's going to be tough to do that in most sophisticated power supplies you use what's called a full wave rectifier which converts this sine wave into this and it does this by inverting this negative part over so that we get positive 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 now we've got our humps closer together we don't have to bridge these big gaps it becomes easier to take the capacitors which are going to charge as this is coming up and then as it's going down they're going to discharge and then it's going to charge again and as it's going back down it's going to discharge and it's going to charge again and then discharge and so forth and then we pretty much get once it's done correctly we get a nice smooth direct current line but if our capacitors are not filling in these gaps we can get something in between here you know we can get a get a current that's doing this kind of thing you know and that will cause our our hum problem as we heard last week now a word about messing with this kind of thing these capacitors what they are doing is storing a static charge that is built up as our current is ramping up they can store that charge for a very long time even if they're broken down and not doing their filtering job as well I do not advise that you go digging around in an old power supply and playing with these capacitors unless you know what you're doing um, now a power supply which is properly designed um, is going to have the circuitry laid out in such a way that when you switch the power supply off all of these capacitors drain to ground but there was a problem on this power supply somebody had cut off that grounding plug on the original uh, line cord well that potentially could give us a situation where there's no place for these to drain even if the circuitry has been arranged correctly for that to happen now, typically, your neutral would also provide drain to ground, but that's dependent on the plug being in the socket in the correct orientation. If it is in the reverse orientation, this thing is going to work like it's supposed to, but the capacitors will not drain. And, of course, the circuitry that creates that drain can fail, so capacitors are something you do not want to mess with so i am showing you this stuff only for informational purposes do not do this at home so our cardboard tube capacitors are in here they're in this circuit and what we're going to do is we're going to desolder on the back here pull those out we're going to put the new capacitors in these two we're going to leave alone for now unless we see that they cause uh, some problems uh, down the road and then uh, we'll test the whole thing out now uh, we just have to put after I replace the capacitors we just have to put this back in the organ try it out see how it's doing and and go from there because I don't have an oscilloscope if I had an oscilloscope I could plug this thing in I could um, test it make sure there's no ripple current but there's other ways to do that and when we get to that point well I'll show you how that's done but any rate that's our that's our power supply and uh, that's what's gonna happen next so I'm waiting to get the replacement capacitors 
and uh, then when that happens, I'll show you how, how that's all done. Now, the other decision that was made on the big 33E has to do with the audio, and that's kind of the main thing we're going to look at today. So let me grab one of those old amplifiers, and we'll take a look. Okay, so this is a Rogers S100 amplifier. I have a bunch of these. This is one of a set of three that I have that I have uh, specially modified. These are newer models, and so had more modern. You can see these are nice modern electrolytic capacitors here. And, um, and uh, I modified this to work both as a conventional Rogers amplifier on a setup, but also so that I can use it in a regular audio uh, system because the S100 amplifier I think is really terrific. So what are the modifications I made? Well, over here it has a standard quarter inch input jack that is wired in parallel with the audio input pin on our five pin socket. Then over on the other end, I have this toggle switch. And this is a relay bypass switch. It is not an on and off switch. So what the switch does is it just simply bridges the relay in such a way that the power bypasses the relay and lights up the power supply section and then powers up the amplifier. With the switch in the off position, the amplifier works as normal. Uh, you plug in the 5-pin plug, the 12-volt relay signal comes in, and it, it, it runs as normal. There's a minimum amount of wiring to achieve these modifications. Um, here's our switch, and it basically just bridges this big capacitor right here. Um, this uh, quarter-inch socket, uh, the ground is the chassis, so it just needs to be wired directly to the pin on the five pin socket and there you go now four of these amplifiers came with the 33e and a couple of them have interesting modifications over here they're definitely older than the other three that i own and i'm wondering hmm that could be a potential problem for us so I have completely changed out the audio system uh, as far as the amplification is concerned for the 33E. And let's go out to the shop and we'll take a look. So here's some pictures I took of the speaker and amplifier situation. Basically what I did was I just set aside all of the Rogers S100 amplifiers and we've instead used this crown. You can see that big behemoth sitting there. Uh, it's a four channel amplifier, puts out a total of a thousand watts, so it's way more than, than uh, what we need. Below, uh, there's going to be other audio gear, as I've always done with my Rogers analog organs. I do things to improve the ensemble character using various effects devices like pitch shift and chorus. And, of course, we want to add some really clean, nice digital reverb to the system. So what I've done here, some of the... Uh, Some of the adapter cords I've made for previous instruments are going to work just potentially work just fine on this instrument. We've got a mixer, I've got a number of devices, we've got a um, active crossover network. So we're really going to take our Rogers speaker system and turn it into a really first class thing. Now this is all hooked up. I've tested it with my phone playing music through it and there's no hum at least on this part of everything and everything sounds really good the speakers are nice and clean now let's talk about some of the unique speakers we have the lower speaker is a roger speaker that was used for any channels that had a lot of bass 
So you have a, a JBL woofer and you have a, a baffle, which instead of a port ventilating the cabinet, the baffle works uh, in the opposing direction as the woofer cone. So only one of these cones is powered. Uh, there's a JBL tweeter there, which in this setup is not going to be used because this is strictly going to be used as a subwoofer. Now on top of this, we have my unique, what I'm calling M7 speakers. Now, uh, the original speakers that came with this instrument involved these eight foot long cabinets, wall mount cabinets that had eight 10 inch full range cones and a single JBL tweeter. I had a number of these uh, boxes that were just a set of six, uh, six by nine speakers. And what I did was I added the JBL uh, tweeter to that. And so Rogers used to have a speaker called the M13, which was 12 six by nines and a JBL tweeter. That was replaced with the M10 M6 setup, where the M10 was six, uh, uh, six by nines and four tweeters. And then if you wanted to augment that, you would add an M6 to it. So you would have uh, an M16, if you will. So since I'm adding a single tweeter to a set of six six by nines, well, we're going to call this an M7. These are the only two M7 speakers in the world and the only two ever made, as far as I know. So we have one of those on each side. On the other side, let's take a look there. We have the Leslie speaker. Now this did have its own amplifier in the cabinet, but I took that out because it's gonna be promote, uh, powered by the Crown, a ch one channel on the Crown amplifier. And I've added a JBL tweeter to this. And it just kinda cleans up the sound. The tweeter is barely on, but it's just enough to make this sound a little better. Above that, we've got another one of my M7s, and then behind that, you'll see one of Roger's uh, exponential cones. This uses a JBL mid-range driver, uh, compression type driver, and then the horn is attached to that. These two speakers are gonna work together to uh, make a nice sound for the solo channel, which is mostly big reed stops. And so we've got a really good uh, setup going on here. All of this is promising to sound very nice. And it's a little more compact and concise and is going to work with the reverb, chorus, and pitch shifting effects that I'm going to add later on uh, a whole lot better. So the other thing I thought we'd take a look at is a little more in-depth look at the tone generator racks. Um, on the Rogers 33E. Um, I've shown these before, these oscillator circuits. This is the main oscillators, and we do two different things with oscillators on the 33E. Uh, many of the reed stops and the string stops, the diapason and the flute, uh, along with many of the percussion sounds, are taken from the main generator. And it has a set of these oscillators. There's the schematic for it. And these oscillators are always running, and then they go through a gate circuit to send the appropriate pitches over to the filter circuits. And we've talked about that before with uh, Devtronics and Schober stuff doing much the same thing. Now here's our signal keying circuits. And what happens here is our key contact comes in here and it comes over, our oscillator signal comes in here. And then once this is lit, then we get a, the tone of the oscillator sending out to the various uh, filter circuits. And you can see here, this is just, you know, represents one note of, of 61. And we have our oscillator signal coming into many, many points. Our keying for the solo manual, the great manual, the accompaniment manual, and the pedal. And then the gate circuits open up and let the signal through to the preamp circuits. So let's go take 
a look at that, what that looks like in real life. Okay, so like I showed you in the drawing, this is what the main tone generator looks like in real life. Over here, we have all the oscillators, low C up to the high C, which is here. And then these are always running. As soon as the organ comes on, these oscillators are all making a tone. And they all go over here to the gate circuits. You can see the wire taking everything over, and there's more wire on the back of the rack for this. Now, what happens in these keyer circuits is we have uh, the great uh, keyboard 16 foot, the solo 8 foot, the great 4 foot, and the great 8 foot. And then these are the pedal and the accompaniment switches here. So what's happening is the oscillator signal that is appropriate for whatever note we have here uh, is, is sitting there waiting. And when we play keys, the gates here are opened up and two things happen. The signal is first sent as a square wave, just what comes off the oscillator. And then there's also, a, in this case, in some cases, a second signal, which is a triangle wave, in which the um, square wave oscillator has been converted into a triangle wave. And I've shown you some circuits that, that do that effect. So on the grate, I think we only have the uh, it's we only have the square wave on the 16, but we have both the square wave and the triangle wave on the eight foot, and then only the triangle wave on the four foot, and then there's similar things going on here. So when I hit a bunch of keys on any of the manuals, all of these gates open up in the appropriate locations, and they send their signal out over to the filter circuits. And that's what all of this stuff is right here. And if we got in close, you can see here's the clarinet, here's the viola de orchestra, the diapason, the concert flute, the solitional and canura, post horn, tuba, etc. Now, let's take a look at the diapason here because it's a, a little simpler to see. Um, I played my keys my appropriate signal comes over to here and this gray these gray things here are a read relay and all it is is a read switch that you would have a magnetic read switch inside a glass tube with a coil of wire around it and when that coil of wire gets activated by the stop key that switch closed and it allows the audio signal that has come from the oscillators through the gate circuits to pass through this point because the stop switch is down, preamp circuit, and then on over here to our filter circuit. And then we have a little potentiometer to adjust the tone. So basically we're sending at all times, when I press keys, we're sending every possible signal out to every possible filter, but it's only when the stop key is down that it allows the signal to pass on through to the filter. From the filter, it goes to the expression module, it goes out to the output module, out to the external amplifiers, and then we hear it. Now there's other controls on the filters. You notice these are similar to what you see over here on the oscillators. They're the same thing, they're an induction coil. And some of the filter circuits have these, and these are adjustable. So for like the big reads, the post horn, the tuba, you can adjust these to adjust the timbre of the signal coming in. So this is pretty simple, and it's really very similar to like the home organ kits from uh, Schober and Devtronics. There you had a simpler system that was a little less sophisticated, but this is doing pretty much the same thing. We have our tone generator running. We open gates to allow the appropriate pitches through. All of those pitches are shaped by our filter circuits. And then we hear the tone on the other end. This is exactly the same technology that's used on an analog synthesizer. If you've ever played around with a mini Moog, you're doing exactly the same thing. It's just that you have dials and knobs 
to make it endlessly variable. So now the tibia oscillators are set up more like a unit rank of pipes in a pipe organ. Each of these oscillators is at rest when it's sitting there and the voltage from the keyboard goes into a series of stop switches just like you would have on a unit pipe organ and then those signals are sent out to the appropriate oscillators triggering them to come on and then those go out to in this case a, a Leslie speaker to generate tremolo effect and this is the simplified uh, switch uh, system and this works very much the same as uh, diode switching on a unit pipe organ uh, the keyboard the notes of the keyboard are connected to these circuits here when the key contact closes there's po potential for these sending out a signal to the appropriate oscillators but it's only after the tibia stop for that uh, for that stop is activated that any signal will pass on through to the oscillators so let's go out and take a look at what that looks like in the real world so here we have our tibia panel we have the same kind of oscillators that we had on the main tone generator but they're applied to the organ in a very, very different way. These oscillators are at rest until we ask for them. This is wired exactly the same way that a unit pipe organ would be wired. So I'm hitting keys and my key signal is coming through to all of these stop switches. So when I hit middle C, all of the middle C's light up. When I hit uh, high C, all of the high C's light up. And if I'm playing chords, they all light up. But the signal doesn't pass through the switch unless the stop switch has been actuated. And then that causes this to go into a different condition. When the stop is off, the signal coming in from the keyboard is sent to ground. It just drains off, doesn't go anywhere. When the stop switch is on, then the condition here changes that gate to that drain to ground has been closed off and now the signal can pass on through to the appropriate oscillator. Just like a rank of pipes on a unit pipe organ, we would be opening valves. In this case, we're just telling these oscillators to make sound. This is about as uh, simple as it gets. Now, on your simpler, less expensive organs from this era, this kind of thing would not have been done. Uh, there would have been an additional filter on the main tone generator to create a tibia sound. But getting a sine wave off of a square wave generator can be tough and to have that side by side and it just doesn't work out as well. Uh, Rogers always used these unit tibias. These appear in their later model uh, theater organs as well. Um, on some of their early classic organs they would have a setup like this for the flute and then they'd have another rack with exactly the same setup for the diapason and then they'd have a third rack that's set up like the main uh, generator for reeds and strings. Um, later on, of course, they started getting down to more sophisticated filters that would pull every possible voice off of a single bank of oscillators. Um, and then of course, digital, where you can just sample the pipe and play it back. Well, that, that makes things easier, doesn't it? Well, thanks for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed the second look at the Rogers 33E. And next time I do one of these videos, it will be after I've taken care of that main power supply and put the new capacitors in it and uh, stuck it back in the organ. And then we'll see what happens. 
Now, the other things that we might be doing are the things I talked about in the previous video where, you know, we might be bypassing that output panel and the uh, inserted, uh, definitely going to bypass that inserted uh, spring reverb that's uh, in, in the system. So there's a lot more to do before we get the uh, audio system finalized. We'll also take a little closer look at the effects devices that I'm going to be inserting into the sound path of the instrument. And we'll look at uh, kind of the pros and cons of doing that kind of thing. Um, I think the organ gives a more satisfying sound uh, when we do that, but some people see it as unrealistic. And we'll talk about that more in depth next time we take a look at the 33E. Thanks for joining me today. We'll see you next time.